on this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Inherently, we recognize that 80% of diseases can be prevented by dealing with stress, by getting movement, getting good sleep, and having good nutrition. The microcosm of what's happening in our gut is related to the macrocosm of what's happening in our world and the diversity of the microbiome. Well, that's a pretty big view. Unproven and disproven methods and treatments. It's the official wiki definition. Would that be the, the same as your definition? Health, performance, nutrition, longevity, ancestral living, biohacking, and much more. My name is Ben Greenfield. Welcome to the show. Welcome to today's show. This one is with a functional medicine doc who talks about your gut, testing your gut, all sorts of other really interesting functional medicine concepts. And I think you're going to dig it. He's a smart dude. Before we jump into today's show, I want to tell you about a couple of things. First of all, we just launched our brand new Flex product at Keon. This is an all-natural, science-backed, high-quality joint formula, and nothing like it exists. I've been popping three at night. I bounce back, honestly, almost like I'm cheating from my workouts. It knocks out joint discomfort. It knocks out soreness. It knocks out swelling from exercise. We've got it full of ingredients you've probably never heard of and never used before, like tumorosaccharides, serapeptase, combined with proteolytic enzymes. It's super bioavailable, um, and there really isn't another joint product like this that exists. We spent over a year creating this thing, and if you have not yet tried the brand new and improved version of Keon Flex, if you're an athlete, if you're injured, if you're constantly sore, um, this thing's going to be a total game changer for you. So you get a 10% discount on it if you go to getkeon.com slash flex. It's getkion.com slash flex and use code BGF10. It's a brand new flex. Getkeon.com slash flex and the code is BGF10. That'll give you 10% off. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by one of the number one ways to naturally increase, guys, your total and free testosterone. And for anybody, both guys and girls, to assist with thyroid health, um, your collagen, your elastin on your skin, it reduces pain, it reduces inflammation. These are the infrared lights. They have red and near-infrared light wavelengths that they produce. Bathe your whole body or spray spot treat any part of your body with this stuff. It's made by this company called Juve. So their panels are low EMF, low flicker, so they're actually healthy. And they're going to give everybody who uses code Ben at their website a free month supply of Keon Aminos, one of our other absolutely fantastic shot in the arm supplements for recovery and for performance. So you get a full free month supply of Keon Berry Aminos and you get your light panel. The way you take advantage of this offer is you go to juve.com slash Ben. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com slash Ben. And then before we jump in, I don't talk about a lot of other podcasts on my show, but there's one that I would really recommend that you check out. It is called The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan's one of my friends. He interviews neuroscientists and Navy SEALs on developing resilience and mental toughness. You know, he has a fantastic interview with an FBI hostage negotiator who teaches you how to get people to like and trust you. Uh, and it, he he's just such a great interviewer. He, he unlocks amazing stories from people who have lived those amazing stories, crazy kidnapping stories, going undercover as a CIA agent, illusionist who can program our brains. It's just basically a, a, a complete mind trip, his show. Every episode has worksheets. You can make sure you're internalizing and applying what you learn from each guest. And um, it's it's very, very good. I really dig his show. Uh, it would be a great one for you to also listen to in addition to this show, of course. Uh, you can find his show, The Jordan Harbinger Show, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Or you can go to jordanharbinger.com slash subscribe. It's H-A-R-B-I-N-G-E-R, jordanharbinger.com dot com slash subscribe. It's a really great podcast. I highly recommend you check it out. Well folks, I know a lot of you 
uh, you email me or you leave comments in a post and you say, how do I find a good doctor? What do I look for in a doctor? And it seems like nine times out of 10, I'm telling many people to at least uh, begin by looking for a, a functional medicine doctor. And my guest on today's show is going to fill us in a little bit more on what exactly functional medicine is and his unique story uh, in terms of how he now practices functional medicine. And we're also going to delve into a lot of other topics I want to ask him about that he's an expert in, like the, the microbiome and uh, some, of the, some of the work he's done in terms of uh, following Linus Pauling. And he's also a shaman, all sorts of interesting things this guy is up to. So uh, his name is Dr. Patrick Hannaway. He's considered to be one of the world's top authorities in the realm of functional medicine. He's a board-certified family physician. Uh, and he's the past president of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. Uh, his practice is called Family to Family, which he runs in Asheville, beautiful area of the country. Uh, he's an initiated shaman, um, I believe, uh, by a tribe in central Mexico, and he incorporates those practices in his healing approach. And uh, he also has a, a long list of credentials. He was the chief medical officer at Genova Diagnostics. He was the director of medical education for the Institute for Functional Medicine. He was the medical director at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, just last week published uh, a Keystone article in the Journal of the American Medical Association about functional medicine, which we'll dive into a little bit today. And in 2017, he won the Linus Pauling Award. So I have a feeling that uh, Dr. Hanaway could probably speak a little bit about functional medicine. Uh, what do you think, Doc? A little bit, yeah. I've uh, I've had a great good fortune. Uh, when I was in medical school in the early 80s, I thought, well, aren't, aren't I supposed to learn about health and well-being? And, and uh, that wasn't what medical school was about. But uh, I picked up a book by Dr. Jeff Bland talking about applying um, nutrition in clinical practice. And I'm like, okay, I'm not outside the box. Some other people are thinking about this. And that was sort of the beginning of a, of a long journey and uh, feel, feel pretty blessed in, in that journey over time of being able to really look at the, you know, the root cause of disease and, and understand, uh, you know, the, the interrelationship. I've been fascinated over time of the, of the way in which other indigenous systems of healing have looked at it. Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, Greek, Persian medicine, uh, Tibetan medicine, and seeing how do they interrelate? How do they see the, the body and the human in different ways? And I relate that to functional medicine, which is about really trying to understand why illness occurs and, and restoring health by addressing the root cause for each individual because we're all unique. Does it get kind of confusing when you're, you're merging that many different forms of medicine or studying the history of those, all those different health practices, because you of course have, you know, whatever constitutional typing or traditional Chinese medicine, you've got, you know, Ayurvedic approaches in Eastern medicine. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, all sorts of, of energy-based medicine and in, in many of these shamanic practices. I mean, like, do you, do you kind of take a little bit from each in your practice or how do you even really interpret how to navigate through that versus just sticking to one approach? Like I'm an Ayurvedic doctor, for example. Well, it's less about dabbling and it's more about synthesis and really understanding that we're really all talking about the human condition. And so within that, uh, I like to quote uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. who said, I, I wouldn't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my right arm for simplicity on the other side of complexity. And that is, you know, like beginning to see patterns of how they emerge. And so while one you know, a traditional Chinese medicine teacher said, you know, anything can come from anything. I said, well, that's really fascinating, but it's not very helpful. <laughs> and, and, you know, now I, I see patterns and that's, and there are patterns in each of these different views and they actually relate to each other because they follow the natural world. The, the patterns in the natural world are the patterns with which we move and live and the way in which life moves. So if I were to come into your clinic and you were to assess me, for example, I would imagine you're using, since you were the, the former chief medical officer at Genova, some form of precise quantified testing, but are you also incorporating you know, any, anything else when you kind of triage a patient or you, you assess them when they first visit as far as identifying which path from all these different forms of medicine is going to be 
be best to take? Well, the, the medicine that I practice is, is functional medicine at this point in time. And so I incorporate these other elements in as necessary as they, as they arise. And I, I may use an explanation or help to understand a nuance through um, integrating, you know, some five element Chinese approach or thinking about um, Ayurveda or Tibetan Ayurveda. But my, my intake is really about gathering information and gathering the story, listening to the person's story. And as I'm listening to the story and the timeline of their life, what I become really interested in is when there's some emotional engagement or emotional shift in the story. And I'd be, oh, there's something that is going to help me to understand what's underneath. And, and then using that as a, as a leverage point to be able to say, do we want to look at the mental, emotional, spiritual aspects? Do we need to look at the nutritional aspects? Do we need to look at, you know, intrinsic uh, root causes that are going to be lifestyle, nutrition especially, or, you know, something extrinsic like an antigen, an infection, or a toxin that they got exposed to that kind of tipped them over in their life? And, you know, so I'm, I'm listening for all of those things so that I can – you know, retell the story in a way that they, that's like, yeah, that's what happened to me. How come no one else has ever said that? And that gives me, you know, the, 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 you know, my, my call it the, the, you know, the Nerika, the opening to be able to follow the path of what's going on for that person. So the one thing that kind of leapt out to me when I was looking at your bio was that you were initiated as a shaman. I'm curious how that happened and how that manifests itself in your in your functional medicine practice that's kind of a unique role for a physician yeah the um the Wichel people the Viradica, uh who are the people who live in the uh, Sierra Madres western Sierra Madres in in Mexico are one of the few people like the Hopi who you know, in, in North America who've never uh, gone through the indoctrination of the church. And so there's still a living tradition that's been there for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, I, I met some people actually in the early 90s, and I wasn't very interested in that. I was very focused on Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan medicine and, and learning Ayurveda and, and each of those things. And I met these people and began to connect a little bit with their teachings. And then I started having a series of dreams. And, you know, I went to the teacher and he said, well, you need to go to this sacred place and, and make offerings. And so I, I began to follow that path and go down to Mexico and work with them uh, two or three times a year, you know, for a week or two at a time. And I've been doing that for about 17 years now, uh, about, uh, eight years into it, I was, I was initiated as a, a Marakame is what they call their healers. A Marakame. Uh, Marakame. I recall that shaman is is a is a Siberian word, um, and so the, what that's what they call their healers, and we've sort of uh, Americanized that or Anglicized that to think that everyone who's a healer within an indigenous community is a shaman, but uh, that's actually a word that is specific to uh, si- Siberian healers. Really, it's a Siberian. Um, but, uh, so, it's, so that's not a uh, that's not an Amazonian term. The idea of a of a shaman. Well, I mean. Every indigenous culture will have their healers, will have their people who are who are listening to the world and listening to the spirit world as well. So, what time type of of practices would you incorporate in your own your your own clinic that would be related to your training as a shaman? Well, some of it is the is the way of listening, and then there are also you know people who who come and who have you know I perceive an issue is a deeper. You know, metaphysical, um, emotional, spiritual issue that's going on. And in that case, I'll say, you know, I really want to see you by the fire and invite them out. And we sit around the, the fire and I, I listen and I, I listen in a different way. I'm really focused on on understanding their story at a, at a deeper level. I'm not, I'm not I, in those settings. I don't really focus on what your B vitamin status is or whether you had a tick bite. Um, I'm focusing on a, a deeper level for that individual. And then I work with the tools that I've been given, uh, to help be able to cleanse, open, reconnect the person to their deeper sense of self. Hmm. That's really interesting. That's a, that's a fascinating background. And like I mentioned to folks, part of the reason I wanted to get you on was to 
kind of delve into what functional medicine actually is and how it incorporates a lot of these different methods that you've described. If you go to Wikipedia, it says functional medicine is a form of alternative medicine that encompasses a number of unproven and disproven methods and treatments. That's the uh, that's the official wiki definition. Would that be the, <laughs> the same as your definition? Well, the thing about functional medicine is that it, it's an operating system. It's a way of thinking and being able to work and integrate the information. So as you you know, observed, when I was in medical school, I was interested in nutrition. And I started studying acupuncture and did you know, some mind-body therapies and, and guided imagery. And then I learned herbology from Tarone Lodog. And then I learned hands-on healing methodologies and began to do energetic healing. And I would say that, that when I saw patients at, at that period of time, you know, coming out of my, my training and being a family doc, and I, I'll note that, you know, I, I first spent a couple of years working in the Albuquerque Indian Hospital, working with the Pueblo people, helping to give them Western medicine. And then with the, the Yupik uh, Eskimo people on the Bering Sea for a couple of years, I learned a lot of medicine. But I also learned a lot about connect, deeply connecting to people. But what I did in those times was I sort of you know, just grab the latest tool that I had. I didn't have a way of integrating an operating system to uh, put all those tools together. And that's what functional medicine does is it says, well, I'm going to I'm going to listen to the person's story and I'm going to try to understand, well, what are the antecedents or precursors to what was going on? Now, that's going to include looking at their genetics and looking at their family history and looking at their their birth and what happened. Then I'm going to look for triggers like what was happening in your life at the time you started feeling ill and by listening to the story I can do that and I'm going to say what are the what are the mediators what are the factors you know if, if we're seeing someone with an inflammatory illness you know are you eating inflammatory foods and then we focus on on their their diet and lifestyle because in inherently we recognize that 80 percent of diseases can be prevented you know by dealing with stress by getting movement getting good sleep and having good nutrition and also having meaning and purpose and, and connection in your life. So that's what we do with functional medicine. Are you able to build insurance for a lot of these, you know, kind of, you know, uh, I guess, you know, as Wikipedia would define disproven and unproven, I would say just less popular forms of medicine or at least less allopathic. But how does it work from, from a billing standpoint in your practice? What we did initially was we recognized that because I'm taking more time to be with people an hour and a half back when we started. Now I take two hours and, you know, I'm gathering a bunch of information from their medical records. Two hours. The, the initial meeting is two hours. Initial one's two oh. hours, but it's also usually an hour to sometimes two hours of gathering information and reading their charts and understanding before I even see them. And so... Insurance isn't going to pay for that. So we have a, a fee-for-service practice. And there are some who have practices where they, they just get all the information in uh, little bits of time, you know, a half an hour at a time so they can bill insurance for it. But insurance really is it, – it cares about it. It pays for volume. It doesn't pay for – it pays for quantity, not for quality. Yeah, which would be one one of the underlying issues with with a physician who is practicing an insurance based practice, really feeling as though they only get fifteen, you know, twenty minutes max with a patient, right? Yeah. Now at Cleveland Clinic, we did um, we did work in an insurance model, and or they they still do. I'm not there anymore, but you know, it was an hour intake, and we gathered a ton of information ahead of time as well, and then would see people more closely, and also have nutritionists and health coaches that were integrated, but all under an insurance billing practice. It's interesting to me, people say unproven. Well, you know, now we have an article in JAMA Open from last week that says, well, when you hear functional medicine as a system to standard of care practice at the Cleveland Clinic, that patients do better uh, in terms of their overall outcomes. They, they, do, they do better for, for this JAMA article. And I'll link to it in the show notes, by the way. Uh, I should mention to folks, it's at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash functional medicine. bengreenfieldfitness.com slash functional medicine is where I'll link to everything that Dr. Hannah and I talk about, including this latest JAMA article. But when you say they did better, are you saying they did better compared to 
patients who were seen by a non-functional medical practitioner? At the Cleveland Clinic, correct. Mm. Interesting. And so we, we, we set up a comparison group of people who looked the same, who had the same kinds of issues, and who as part of the Cleveland Clinic, it's, it's focused in being able to look at, at overall global outcomes measures. Uh, the tool is called Promise. It was a patient reported outcomes measures, spent about $78 million, the NIH, to put that together. And, and that's something that is a globally validated tool that we can say, well, when people do, are doing better in Promise, they're doing better overall and their health co- healthcare costs are less. So we've got another study that we're we're um, in the process of doing the data analysis on that's looking at cost as well um, because people say, oh, functional medicine costs a lot of money. And yet we're finding that well, when people are doing better, they spend less money on health care. And so that, that uh, study is uh, not complete yet, but uh, it's uh, looking good. Hmm. And that, that other study, the one that just came out in JAMA, uh, how many people did you actually look at? Um, that was one where we started with over 5,000 people. We coned it down to ended up having um, two, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it was like um, 212 people compared to 424 people, something like that. Okay. Uh, so we had a um, like a two to one control. So there were two people for every one that we saw. And where the where the thing was is we needed to have people that we had data on and controls that we had data on for over a whole period of time, and that took us a little while to be able to get. So that's uh, that was a limitation, but it it was taking all comers. It wasn't taking people with a specific disease state. It's saying no matter what you show up with, we're going to include you in the study, and that's uh, you know it's it's taking it's just like clinical practice. Now, well, I, I got sent this study last week, and I was looking over it last week in preparation for the interview, and I, I thought it was more than that. Like for, I, I have a number of like 7,000, 7,500, something like that in my head as far as the total number of, of patients enrolled in this study. Is that not correct? Well, the initial number of patients that we compared with, we started with over um, 1,800 patients and then in functional medicine, and then we had a three-to-one control group and so it was over 7,000, but then when you cone okay. it down to the people who actually we have a full year's data set on and, and we can directly compare, it ended up being, and I think my numbers are, I have to look at it again, but I think it's like 250 and 500 in the control group, something okay. like that. Okay, got it. Uh, now, often on this show, we like to you know take that big picture overview that we just gave people on functional medicine, but also dive a little bit more into brass tacks. I know you're doing a lot in your clinic when it comes to you know five element Chinese medicine and osteopathic manipulation and herbology and and uh, what I'm curious about is. Uh, different tools that you might use if you wanted to name a couple that you find particularly intriguing or that you you find yourself using quite a bit in your practice um yeah you asked that right up front and you know interestingly when i was first in practice i probably did more testing than i needed to do to begin to understand what was going on now i'm at a point where i look at uh, i want to understand what's going on with a person nutritionally and i can use tools that give me an opportunity to be able to look at the functional need for micronutrients of B vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. That's that's one kind of tool that I use that's very helpful. The other one that I, I've used over time is a form of stool testing to understand, well, what's going on with digestion? What's going on with inflammation? What's going on with the gut microbiome? And, you know, we've just seen the explosion of information on the, on the gut microbiome. And now we see the development of new technology looking at metagenomic sequencing, uh, such as the tool um, developed by Longevity Health, uh, the gut biotest that allows us to have, you know, really kind of the, the cutting edge understanding of what's going on and one that is the most well validated, has the best resolution, has the best sensitivity of any kind of testing of the, of the gut microbiome Wait, available. Which, which one are world. you talking about for the microbiome? Which test? Well, it's called it's called Gut Bio, and it's developed by Longevity Health. Okay. And, yeah, I've I've and had the, them on my podcast. I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. But I interviewed uh, Joel Dudley 
and um, Chris, who's Chris Mason. Yeah, and Chris Mason, brilliant guys. I went over yep. there to New York to their their offices and interviewed them. And you know, shortly thereafter, they started shipping these gut bio kits all over the states for people. Uh, I think uh, most folks just kind of interpreted it as yet another microbiome test. But you seem to feel differently about the about the test and its quality. Well, there's a couple different aspects to that. First, I'll say that, you know, as you know, I've worked with Genova Diagnostics for a long period of time. I, I first started uh, doing stool testing in 1991. And so I'm pretty familiar with it for some period of time. And at that point in time, we just did culture. And then, you know, we moved into in about 10 years ago of being able to use, uh, you know, 16S ribosomal RNA. That's just a way of being able to determine different species that are present. Each different bacteria that's in our gut has a different 16S ribosomal subunit. You don't really need to know the details of that. It's just that that's how speciation occurs. But the issue with that is that everyone had a different library. And if you had it tested through Ubiome or a university or Genova Diagnostics, you get a different result. Now, it would help us to understand shifts in community diversity. That was, all of them were helpful, but you wouldn't have a, there was no standardization that was present. And then along came um, the idea of doing, you know, sort of shotgun blast metagenomic sequencing, which was taking what uh, Craig Venter did with the human biome and applying it to the gut microbiome. Now, the difference is, is that with the human you know, biome, we've got, you know, 3.6 um, million, uh, 3.6 million base pairs. And I'm sorry, you got 3.6 million SNPs. You got about um, 3.6 billion base pairs, but with, and only 23,000 genes. But in the gut microbiome, you have about 150 times more genetic material. And so trying to do the, the, the blast sequence of being able to blast everything apart and then put it all back together and say what's there and quantify it took a lot more um, computing power to be able to do that. Now there are standard libraries that are done. And over the past three, four years in the academic centers, this is the standard which is done, is metagenomic sequencing. And I've been searching for you know, some company that is ready to do that and bring it into clinical practice because it, it feels like it's a, a much better tool. It's where it's where we're going. And that's that's different than shotgun sequencing, right? No, it is a shotgun sequencing. Okay, so, so, so what you're referring to is shotgun we, sequencing. The other one that you think is less accurate is 16S. Yeah, so 16S is a series of probes where we're saying, okay, we're going to, we know that if uh, E. coli uh, looks like this, we're going to have a probe to E. coli. But but we might not have a, a probe to some other new bacteria that aren't there. And we're and generally, we're going to look at, say, you know, 24 or 50 probes to be able to do that. Now, when each one of us has about 150 to 250 bacteria in our gut out of a possible 2,500 that have been identified in the libraries, and we're all different and unique. So diversity in me is different than diversity in you. Is, and I like to say, like, well, so difference, diversity in Hong Kong is different than diversity in New York City is different than diversity in Paris. And we're all, we're all unique and different. But if we're just looking at a limited number of probes, we're not really going to get the whole picture of what's going on. We're going to get a limited picture. So that's one aspect of why metagenomics is important and useful. The other aspect lies... It, with what Longevity Health has done with uh, Chris Mason and Joel Dudley, where they're taking machine learning and artificial intelligence, intelligence and being able to understand well, what do these patterns really mean as it relates to the symptoms that people are having and their physical issues. Now we're learning from what's going on and we're beginning to describe and they've got better tools in order to be able to do that. So the, the gut bio test allows us to be able to say, well, we can look at the metagenomics sequence and we can understand what's happening with digestion. We can understand what's happening with inflammation. We can actually do what are called virtual metabolomics where we can get a sense of, well, what are the short chain fatty acids that are there, which is the, the, the money in the economy of the gut. And they can begin to delve into 
a, a much deeper understanding of overall gut health. And, and as we know, health begins in the gut, disease begins in the gut. And so as we see changes that are going on, we're going to be able to understand relationships of what, going, what goes on in the microbiome as it relates to different stages of different diseases for different individuals. And we're going to be able to do something about it. And that's super exciting to me because it's really taking this and, and turning it on its on its ear. Now, th- this I think confuses some people, and it's basically this fact that before companies like Longevity, and you know, Viome is another one that I've discussed on the show. Even though I, I think they use 16s, and Viome uses Shotgun, I believe. Vi- Viome is using transcriptomics, so it's it's looking at the the RNA itself, not through probes, but it's looking at the RNA itself. But it, there's no standardization along that, whereas with metagenomic sequencing, there is. Everyone's working off of the same library around the world. Hey, I want to interrupt today's show to tell you about my pantry. So my pantry is an absolutely amazing place to live. I have organic coconut flake cereal. I have organic virgin coconut oil. I have organic coconut wraps. It kind of looks like you walked onto a coconut island. Unsweetened toasted coconut flakes. Mm -mm. I get all my coconut products and plenty more from my dark chocolate to my nut butters to all those other crack cocaine-esque pantry foods from my favorite place to shop online for healthy food, organic food, natural products at 25 to 50% below traditional retail prices, and that is Thrive Market. So Thrive Market is basically like Whole Foods, met Costco, and had a little healthy baby, but you can't find most of their stuff on Amazon. They knock prices down completely through the floor, and they're going to give all my listeners 25% off your first order and a free 30-day trial. If you go to their website at thrivemarket.com slash Ben, you can peruse some of my favorite healthy pantry products, and you can go ape nuts ordering all your own healthy stuff to keep your body feeling good, especially over the holidays when you're surrounded by unhealthy food. Thrive Market, you pretty much know anything you order from them is healthy and has been vetted by their crack team over there. So 25 to 50% off their prices are already marked down. They're going to give you an extra 25% off your first order and a free 30-day trial if you go to thrivemarket.com slash Ben. That's thrivemarket.com slash Ben. And then also, with the holidays coming up, you may want to check out the brand new sponsor of our show, movement watches so not only do they have watches they've got sunglasses they've got a whole bunch of other accessories they just dropped a super sleek uh it's a hexagonal watch it's called the odyssey uh they also have a 1960s american muscle car inspired black top watch selection and the cool thing is that these are watches that you would normally pay 400 to 500 bucks for but they cut out the middleman they go straight to you their watches start at just 95 bucks so you can go and take all that money you're going to save on your christmas gifts on your own style watches sunglasses etc and spend it on maybe a better turkey for thanksgiving or a whole bunch of ribeye steaks for christmas day or whatever else you want to spend that hard-earned money on so movement very simple mvmt is how you pronounce it or how you spell it rather mvmt.com slash ben gets you free shipping free returns and 15 percent off it's mvmt.com slash ben free shipping free returns 15 percent off perfect place to shop for some of your holiday gifts so based on this, prior to these tests being available, I used to always recommend folks, uh, and this is right up your alley, use something like a Genova Diagnostics GIFX stool profile, uh, usually like a three-day profile where you're getting a sampling over several days, which I understand to be a little bit more accurate than the, than the single-day panel. And that is a panel that advertises itself as being able to detect, you know, most of the common parasites and then yeast and bacteria and I believe inflammatory markers as well, like, you know, calprotectin, for example. And I I think some people might be confused about whether or not getting a test like that would be redundant with getting something like a longevity gut biome test that's looking at the actual microbiome of the gut. Do people need to get both or can you get just about everything that you would get out of a GI effects panel from something like a gut bio? 
Well, that, that's a great question, and I think the answer on that is still to be determined. So I, I have, um, I'll, you know, I worked as the medical director, chief medical officer at the Genova for ten years. I, you know, markers like uh, calprotectin and pancreatic elastase were tools that I actually was the one involved in getting FDA approval and getting CPT code status for them. So I'm very familiar with them and have published on on each of them. They're great individual biomarkers looking at inflammation and looking at at digestion. They also, the GIFX has you know, different ways of being able to look at the, at the gut microbiome. It uses culture methodology that's been around for 50 plus years. It's been using uh, the 16S probes that we talked about that are going to help us get a, an idea of diversity and what's going on, but they aren't going to give us all the details and they're not as sensitive. And they also have some markers of directly measuring the metabolomics, the metabolic byproducts of the bacteria. Now, what the gut biotest does is it's able to give us kind of everything that's going on there. So I can look at and say, well, I have 198 species. Here are the species and here, here is how much is there. And that is exactly what's in me. And I can get an understanding of what's going on virtually because they're looking at the genes of what's happening with the bacteria in my gut metabolically. Those are very useful pieces of information that are not available on a test like the GI effects. But they, but the individual biomarkers looking at inflammation or digestion like calprotectin, which is a validated tool, or pancreatic elastase, which is a validated tool, those would need to be done separately. You can get some inference on the gut biotest about an inflammation score based upon the the machine learning that Joel Dudley has helped put together. You can get a, an understanding of what's happening with digestion based upon who's who's living in the in the hood uh, that are helpful with digestion, but you don't get an exact answer. Hmm. Interesting. So so at this point, if you wanted the best of both worlds, you'd have to get both tests. Uh, it, it, it sounds like that would be appropriate if if you wanted to see everything that was going on in the gut. You'd have to get like a GIFX panel and a and a gut bio panel, or you can get some of the individual biomarkers like pancreatic elastase and calprotectin from just about any laboratory in the country, and and then look at the gut bio test to really get an understanding of the gut microbiome. There's there's no better test for the gut microbiome than what longevity health has put together. Oh, that's a, that's a powerful statement. Okay. It's, um, the, the, the GI effects panel, um, then like you mentioned, you probably could save some money by just getting like calprotectin and pancreatic elastase and a few of the things you wouldn't be getting with something like a gut bio. Do you think that in the future, some of these microbiome tests you know, like the gut bio would also be able to offer those type of markers on the panel? I'm hoping we can get there. Yeah, that would be cool to only have to fiddle around with one. Yeah, and part of it, Ben, is is they're going to be working on doing the comparisons to see can you actually predict exactly what the calprotectin level is going to be. That's what the beauty of what, what Joel Dudley's work is and the machine learning is to be able to make those comparisons. We don't know that yet. For example, there is a low-level inflammation that we have a pretty good idea is happening for a lot of people that's based in the microbiome, and we don't see changes in inflammatory markers of the gut yet. And we don't see changes in CRP, but we know that there's something that's going on with inflammation. We look at these millions of people with autoimmune diseases, and you know, we're not actually able to pick up well, where's the inflammation. We know there's something going on with the immune system, and it's our hope that we're going to be able to characterize that with the with the the gut biotest and and metagenomic sequencing and machine learning and virtual metabolomics. So that's uh, that's to me where the where the puck is going. Okay, got it. And again, kind of boots on the ground. Can you give me an example of something that you might see, or, or perhaps even as you just alluded to with the case of inflammation, something you see repeatedly on something like a gut bio in many people and, and what steps from a functional medicine standpoint you would then take to address something like that? Well, with the, with the gut bio test, where I'm, where I'm going is I'm looking at um, some of the, the scores that are, are put together where we're going to look at a, uh, a microbiome-based inflammation score. 
And that's going to tell me, okay, so here's an inflammation that's going on. Now I need to work with some specific agents. And they may be, they may be uh, fish oils and omega-3 fats. They may be using uh, turmeric and various formulations of turmeric at, at therapeutic doses, 500 to 1,000 milligrams twice a day. They may be using Boswellia. That, you know, I've got a whole series of kinds of things and tools that I work with that I'm able to apply when I know that there is an inflammatory issue that's going on, or if I see that there's a permeability issue that's going on, then, you know, that I can tell from, from the gut bio test. So with each of these factors, um, I'm getting deeper into an understanding. Now, um, where, where they're going is being able to take that and not only look at the immune system and, and, but to more deeply look at digestion to understand you know, where your fiber needs are, but also being able to look at the enteric nervous system and the whole um, brain gut microbiome connection, which is fascinating. We see this whole idea of psychobiotics and prebiotics that are going to help the bacteria that will have an effect on your mood, on depression and anxiety. And this to me is really a whole fascinating new field that we're going to be looking at the gut to treat patients who have you know, depression and anxiety and, and mental health and neurological disorders. That's really fascinating. That's interesting. And not many people have used the term psychobiotics on the show before, but I know it's been several <laughs> years now since, you know, articles have been appearing on PubMed about this idea that probiotics, when ingested, can confer beneficial effects to the to the central nervous system and you know regulate the HPA axis and the glucocorticoid stress response. It's it's very interesting that you know these things in a way are, are almost like uh, like mini psychedelics. Well, you can think of them that way, or you can think of them. You know, I'm I'm actually more interested in what are the foods and what are the prebiotics that help your bacteria to grow to be able to bring balance back to the system overall. And so here's, let me give you an example of how, sort of the, if you will, the oddness of my thinking, but how these pieces fit together is that we know that through the 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 gut it produces cytokines that may be pro or anti-inflammatory it produces metabolites there are more metabolites that come from our gut than there are circulating from from our own cells there's um information that is stimulated from the vagal nerve going back up to the brain there are neurotransmitters like serotonin 95 percent of the serotonin in the body is in the gut all that information is going up into the brain, 10 times more information going in that direction than in the other direction. Now, where it goes is it goes first to the amygdala, which is involved in our emotional relationship to the world and gathers information from our memory. And it goes to another place called the insular cortex. And our insular cortex is a small little area that helps to define our own sense of self. So from there... That information then goes to the HPA axis and determines well, what's going to happen hormonally. It goes to um, our whole reactivity. It connects to our emotions. So to me, like, okay, so what I'm taking in from the environment, the, the dog that I'm touching, the, the water that I'm drinking or bathing in, the food that I'm eating, every environmental in, in, input is being um, – related to or filtered through my gut microbiome and it's sending signals to my brain that help me to understand who I am and how do I relate to the world and what is the emotional connection. Well, that to me is super fascinating because it now puts us at, in direct relationship where the, the microcosm of what's happening in our gut is related to the macrocosm of what's happening in our world and the diversity of the microbiome and it connects to our own sense of self and relationship to the world. Well, that's a pretty big view. And that's a view that systems like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine have talked about for a long time of how those elements fit together. That's what I'm interested in. That's really fascinating. And, and for those of you interested, I'll link to a, to a paper on this concept of psychobiotics in the show notes at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash functional medicine if you want to dig into this a little bit more. It's a fascinating field. You said that earlier, um, Dr. Hanaway, all health begins in the gut or you, you start with the gut or something to that effect. But, I mean, wouldn't there be some exceptions to that? Like, like for example, like a, like a traumatic brain injury or a concussion – 
you know, I, I, that, that might be a situation where it kind of starts with the head, right? Because we know that, you know, bacterial infections in the GI tract seem to pop up in response to brain inflammation. And, and there tends to be kind of a, a shift in, in gut health and often gut dysfunction frequently follows a traumatic brain injury. Do you ever kind of start higher up, start with the, the computer up in the skull? Hardly ever because, um, but you know, we are now learning that, and we've, we've known for some time that there's a relationship between the intestinal permeability in the gut and the blood brain permeability. Now, what we've learned more recently is that when people have con- concussions and traumatic brain injury, it actually changes intestinal permeability. So now, why do you have more increased risk of infections? Well, you've got more permeability that's going on. So when I'm treating someone who's got a traumatic brain injury or a concussion, I'm going to use anti-inflammatories and fish oils to be, you know, at high doses to be able to help them out. But I'm also going to be focusing on how do I ensure that the, the, the intestinal permeability is taken care of, that there's no leakiness in the gut. And so I'm going to be using agents like, you know, glutamine and aloe and large arabinogalactans and other kinds of things that are going to be helping to heal the lining of the gut as well, where most people aren't necessarily thinking that way. Hmm. Okay. So, so you can work on the blood brain barrier and the gut blood barrier simultaneously in a situation like that. The, the gut barrier, absolutely. And it's necessary to be able to do. So it's odd to, you know, you recognize, wow concussions lead to changes in intestinal permeability who would have guessed that and yet you know these things are are intimately related to each other so i do you know look at what's going on with the microbiome so that i can have the right bacteria that the right gut microbiome that's there so that, that it's helping to soothe that there is more you know gaba being released and there's some great papers as you said that that study and look at what are the specific probiotics that are going to help to um, cause some downregulation of brain activity and downregulation of brain inflammation that's going on. And for myself, then I continue to look to, well, what are the prebiotics and what are the foods that can actually do that? I'm more interested in that than I am in trying to find the designer probiotics. Probiotics are useful therapeutically but recall that they're tourists. They come in and they affect the economy of what's going in the gut, on in the gut while they're there. And then they leave. They're gone. They're gone within 13 days uh, after ingesting them. So they may have some long-lasting effect like, a, like a, a tourist economy does in the town of Asheville where I live. Um, but you don't want to be reliant on that. You want to be able to provide the foods that are going to help the good bacteria in your own gut to be able to grow. And we know that diet changes the microbiome within one to two days. But you wow. got to stay on that new diet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of of TBI, I know they're also now looking into things like uh, fecal microbiota transplant as one method of addressing a lot of the inflammation. Have you? looked into that in your clinic at all yet or is that something you have your eyes on well i i have i have for some time actually i, I went and uh and and met with uh, tom barati in sydney australia about 11 years ago to learn how this was done and came back with uh you know the idea that i wanted to start to do this in practice and talked with a colleague about it and then i had an interesting experience i met with uh one of the foremost uh, um, gi researchers uh, fergus shanahan who in cork who focuses on inflammatory bowel disease and and he's been working with these kinds of tools and he said to me patrick if the microbiome can have an effect on causing cancer and heart disease and you know and autoimmune disease and you know, inflammatory bowel disease and, and, you know, just about anything. If you're giving someone else, someone else's microbiome, are you, do you really understand what risk you're giving at that point in time? You can make sure that it doesn't have any infection in it, but do you, are you potentially giving them some other disease that they wouldn't have had because you're transplanting their microbiome in there? And that gave me pause. And I said, well, you know, we really don't know enough. And that is why the FDA has has labeled it as, you know, the, the fecal microbial transplant as a drug and has limited studies on it. And there's some fascinating new 
uh, research that's coming out and some new companies that are coming out looking at uh, at the poop pill and the ability to be able to do that. And in fact, just uh, yesterday, or I guess it was on the 30th, um, uh, in the New England Journal, there were a series of articles that came out talking about uh, two patients who died um, in, uh, from fecal microbial transplant and how we actually screen stool for being able being able to do that and how to set standards that have not been there for fecal microbial transplant. So I find it to be an important and powerful tool and not something that I want to just have my patients do, you know, have a, a DIY mechanism for doing it by buying a blender at Goodwill, you know, and, and getting their best friend's poop and, and doing a transplant. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. And I, I actually saw that, that report about the couple of folks who died from the FMT and that was even the pill that wasn't like they were hanging themselves upside down their living room and you know dumping a bunch of poop up their backsides they were actually just using like <laughs> encapsulated stool transplantation right and there's a couple of companies that are doing that but they're you know and, and there's also some that are are going through you know phase two and phase three clinical trials to be able to look at not only um recurrent c diff which is where it has been validated and these patients you know can die from that and it's got a 90 percent cure rate so that's a good idea but if you've got someone with irritable bowel syndrome you know do you really want to do that take on some unknown risk it looks like it's going to be helpful for ulcerative colitis. Uh, there's some fascinating studies around its role in autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and, you know, those are in phase two trials at this point in time. And there are some other things that raise a question that there's a subset of patients who have uh, type 2 diabetes and prediabetes and metabolic syndrome who may benefit from it. But we don't know yet well, what, what do we need to give them and which subset of patients are actually going to respond? And we don't know the other risks. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to let the, uh, let the process bear itself out rather than have patients, um, do it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, I think it was E. coli that those folks wound up being infected with like an antibiotic resistant form of E. coli, which is sad. Exactly. Um, now you talked about how you actually don't really like to go to designer based probiotics and you instead like to use food as much as possible to modulate the biome. I'm curious if there are particular foods that you find yourself repeatedly turning to in your practice, whether it's a, you know, like I interviewed Dr. William Davis and he has a L. Ruturi strain of yogurt that he's very keen on and recommends to a lot of his patients for, you know, that gut brain connection, you know, increasing oxytocin and decreasing appetite cravings. Uh, and also, you know, he's seen some positive responses in, in body composition and things like that with, with that strain, uh, which he actually describes if, if folks are listening, they can go listen to my podcast with Dr. Davis. Uh, but how about you? Do you have any special yogurt recipes or, you know, kimchi or sauerkraut or anything you're really recommending? a lot to people? Well, it's focusing on, you know, being able to work with fermented foods and finding out, you know, culturally where they're at. You know, are you going to eat kimchi? Some people will, some people hate it. Are you going to eat sauerkraut? Some people will, some people won't. You know, working with uh, yogurts that they uh, make themselves. I particularly uh, work with goat yogurts and um, I'm a big fan of some of the coconut kit kefirs that are out there because so those are all foods that are going to you know have they're going to be fermented and they're going to have live uh, bacteria that are present in them more at this point in time i'm going to saying well, what can we do with acacia root and what can we use with uh, uh with with bioflavonoids and and isoflavones from pomegranate from blueberry from cranberry all of which help to activate the beneficial bacteria to be able to grow and so you know previously I would use fructo oligosaccharides and inulin but you know, now I'm focusing more on modified citrus pectin acacia root and and these other agents as simple specific ways of helping the beneficial bacteria to be able to grow in the gut I use probiotics when I'm using them therapeutically. So if I've got a patient, you know, who's got inflammatory bowel disease, you know, I'm using a, a combination of, you know, four strains of four species of bifido and three species of lacto and streptomophilus at specific doses, you know, to induce remission. I know it works. The, the data is pretty clear. If I've got someone with IBS, there's a couple different 
um, probiotic formulations that I'm, I'm going to use. Bifidobacter infantis 35624 clearly demonstrated in the literature. There's some other combinations of lacto and bifido that have also worked well. Uh, we're learning new things every day in terms in terms of that. I'm less focused on on here's the probiotic that's good for everything because the probiotics that are good for dealing with you know monilial vaginitis and recurrent can you know candida uh, problems are different. Uh, when I'm working with someone who I'm uh, is getting an antibiotic for some reason, even if I may need it to use it to help um, clean out their their gut that's that's really got a pathogenic dysbiosis that's going on, I'm going to use Saccharomyces boulardii along with that. If I've got someone who I think has has problems with with biofilm, you know, I'm going to use a, a product called Biome Biome Health. That's a, a wonderful combination product to be able to do. But again, they're all for specific therapeutic indications. Yeah. And that, well, how about pomegranate peel extract? That's something that I've come across quite a bit now, kind of being used as a sort of prebiotic. And uh, particularly what intrigued me, I came across this when I was working on some research for this new book or a chapter in this new book I'm uh, releasing on anti-aging and longevity, how this pomegranate peel extract is actually uh, helping to produce something called urolithin A in the gut. And urolithin A is something that seems to, especially in aging humans, support you know mitochondrial health and mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis. And having this pomegranate peel is part of a of a fermented food rich diet or a, or a probiotic protocol appears to be a really good way to do that have you started to use any form of pomegranate in your practice at all well i have through um through products that that look at, at pomegranate extract to be able to help with the the gut bacteria to help as a as a prebiotic and the isoflavone um that really helps to improve and change and shift the overall diversity in the microbiome uh including increasing acromancia which is anti-inflammatory in nature um but i've also found that uh that other forms of elagic acid uh which is the active ingredient in in pomegranate i'm not sure if it's in pomegranate peel i'm not sure about that aspect of it but other uh, pomegranate extracts you know are focused on elagic acid and how to be able to use that as a measure to modify the urolithins that are that are present there. But I'm not familiar with the anti-aging research that you're talking about, and I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, it's called urolithin A. I'll I'll try and hunt down one of the one of the PubMed studies on this and, and put a link to it in the show notes for folks. And I think uh, it, it's the both the seed and the peel, but I believe the peel is where where the majority of those uh, those compounds reside. So that's a that's an interesting interesting fruit and one of one of my when i the, the more i see on pomegranates the more i think that that's probably if you're going to choose one fruit to consume regularly that'd probably be one of them yeah i also um am familiar with some fascinating research on uh the pomegranate extract and allergic acid that is specific to decreasing diabetes and prediabetes and metabolic syndrome yeah yeah, it's interesting. Um, now, a couple other things that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is, you know, we discussed, you know, longevity and this gut bio testing and, and how that's one of your go to's as far as like, a, you know, kind of a staple of your functional medicine practice, starting with the gut. But when it comes to, you know, other tests that you might find yourself running frequently, you know, again, I, I have to ask you this, just knowing your background in Genova Diagnostics. Um, you know, whether it's a micronutrient analysis or, or a urinary panel or other, other kind of go-to tests that you find to be particularly informative? Well, I mentioned uh, right up front looking at nutritional status of an individual. So there's a test there called the NutriVal that is a combination of urinary organic acids, plasma amino acids, uh, whole blood uh, fatty acids, markers of oxidative stress, and, and then um, whole blood uh, markers of, of minerals, both um, nutritive and, and toxic minerals, heavy metals. Um, that is synthesized together in an algorithm that helps to give very specific recommendations around antioxidants, B vitamins, and minerals and what can be done. It gives some additional information beyond that about, uh, about um, 
mitochondrial function, about toxic exposure, about methylation. And that's a tool that um, I myself and my team helped put together about 13 years ago um, that is an algorithm that's based upon the peer-reviewed literature and is is well thought through. And I use that a lot in my practice. Yeah, that that's that you're you're probably like the tenth doctor that's that's recommended that on the show, that Nutraval test. It's I mean it's it's extremely comprehensive and you know, with that one, even, even the information that comes with it, like the sample report and, you know, folks were to go to like the Genova diagnostics website, you could, you could see a sample report. I mean, it's, it's honestly something that even a patient can go through and read and get a lot of good information from, you know, I, I find it to be a pretty user-friendly test. Well, I appreciate that because uh, I was, you know, our team was deeply involved in the design of that because that's what we wanted it to be is, is helping patients to understand how to improve their own health and well-being. Yeah, and that that test now, from what I understand, they're also doing uh, the option to add genomics onto that, like look at like your MTHFR SNPs or your COMT or, or APOE or things like that, right? That's exactly right. So that is an, a, a value add that you can do specifically patients. Um, I, I do also like to, um, you know, if patients have 23andMe data, many, many people do and take that and run that through an algorithm like, uh, you know, Rhonda Patrick's found my fitness or the pure genomics, uh, algorithm, uh, um, or Intellex DNA. There's, there's a number of, uh, aftermarket tools. And I just sort of say it's important if you're going to use those to, you know, use tools that are well curated and well validated, not tools that are just trying to sell a product, um, you know, in the the aftermarket use of of gathering information from your 23andMe data. Um, so I'll do that with some patients. You asked about other testing. I'll just say that you know I'm I'm looking at at extrinsic factors um, of triggers. So I, I may do heavy metal testing where I'm looking at a, a provocation test to measure a toxic element clearance and see do they have excess heavy metals. I, I may do tick-borne illness testing uh, that's going on. Um, I, I like to work with Igenix because I find that uh, I don't have to deal with the, the false negative tests that I may get from the standard laboratories. You know, those are some of the common things that I use. Uh, hormonal testing, uh, sometimes urinary hormonal testing. Um, sometimes I'll work with Genova Diagnostics. Sometimes I'll work with uh, Precision Analytic uh, and their Dutch test, which is yeah, uh, both of them. They're, they're both they're both uh, they're they're pretty much the same test and and they're both you know great tools for helping me to understand. Yeah, the uh, the uh, genetic tool I used to use for a while just because it was very simple and clean and you know cost like ten bucks I believe to upload your twenty three and Me data to was Promethease and they were since acquired by uh, My Heritage and I've been keeping my eye on My Heritage. It looks like they're kind of running out some. Some cool tests that delve into a little bit more than than you'd get from your twenty three and Me data, and then of course, you know, for folks who want to do it all, you can you can do the the whole genome sequencing, which I think uh, it's a company in L A now. Uh, Health Nucleus is now offering that, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I get a lot of interesting data out of the genetics as well. Yeah, so Health Nucleus, yeah, I mean they're out of San Diego. That's a uh, um the, the company that was first started by, by Craig Venter there. But the issue is that you can't take that data and put it through some of the, uh, some of the aftermarket tools yet. They're not set to be able to get the whole genome data. And I particularly like Rhonda Patrick's found my fitness, uh, I found that she's got really good curation of the data, continues to update it, and is taking the 23andMe data. And that's one I like to use with patients. Yeah, yeah. And hers is, uh, is it just called Found My Fitness? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll link to that in the show notes for folks. Uh, now, uh, w- one other thing that I wanted to ask you regarding functional medicine was, you know, I, I know kind of similar to how a guy like me is getting around to different health conferences and fitness conferences and keeping my finger on the pulse of what the latest energy drink or, you know, ab training devices. I know you get around to a lot of functional medicine conferences, and I'm curious if coming down the pipeline, there are any particularly intriguing or hot topics these days that are being talked about at these functional medicine conferences. The big questions have been in relationship to dealing with autoimmune disease and dealing with cognitive impairment. You know, there's so many people who are interested and concerned about, well, what can I do to ensure that my my memory is not going to deteriorate and how do I evaluate that and what kinds of um, 
supplements and support can I use? Uh, Dale Bredesen's work has kind of opened the door on all that. I find it to be really useful consideration. And we have seen that there's it's certainly a subset of patients, not everybody, but a significant subset of patients who do have a reversal of their cognitive impairment uh, from taking these approaches that are going to include, you know, diet and lifestyle and exercise and, and being able to define, well, where's the problem? Where's the imbalance that's going on? Is it related to an APOE4 status where I need to really pay attention to toxin exposure and antioxidants and look for infections? Or is it related to some hormonal imbalances where I'm more atrial? Or is it related to a a metabolic syndrome, kind of a glucose toxicity issue? And I like the way in which Dale has has framed that out. And, you know, those are are big issues uh, in the current state um, and as well as autoimmune disease because we see so many people with nonspecific autoimmune diseases. And, you know, they really are under the the big category of 100 plus diseases that is affecting 54 million Americans at this point in time. And from a functional medicine perspective, we're thinking about them in a similar way. We're not trying to stratify into what do I do for ankylosing spondylitis or what do I do for Sjogren's disease rather we're looking at well what do I do for autoimmune disease and then there may be some specific things that for ankylosing spondylitis one I'll just pick that you know it's like you know, we see these uh, biologic drugs being advertised at night on TV to individuals and yet it's Related to a genetic predisposition with intestinal permeability in the presence of a specific Klebsiella uh, that is a reactive to into the in the joints in the lower back that induces that. So, gosh, we want to deal with permeability in the gut microbiome when we're dealing with that, and here we are back to the same thing that we've been talking about. So, those are some some big. Um, big things that are out there from the disease standpoint and then from the from the standpoint of um, how do we look at the individual I think you know we've already been talking about the importance of the microbiome and how to understand it and I think one of the things that I try to emphasize is that it's really about the community that's present of the microbiome it's not so much about the individual microbes that are present in your gut now in certain pathogenic cases that's true but generally Generally, you know, I'm not trying to increase someone's acromancia. I'm not trying to decrease someone's methanobacter. I, I'm trying to help the overall population to move into balance. And this is something that, you know, a systems approach and a machine learning approach like uh, Gut Bio is using is something that is taking that into account. And it's not trying to just focus on, oh, I see a, a lack of bifidobacter, so I'm going to dump a lot of bifidobacter in the system. That's sort of how we used to do it 20 years ago. And we would we would force changes in the system by giving a big input, um, but it's not a long-term therapeutic option. Yeah, interesting. Well, I mean, I, I, I think one big takeaway here for folks, you know, at least for me personally, would be a quantify the biome. You know, you use something like gut bio to actually see what's going on. B use rather than like you know putting all of your your efforts towards some targeted probiotic regime instead wide variety of fermented foods and you know both prebiotics and probiotics from a food base standpoint and then finally address the actual gut lining you know i know there are, there are a ton of nutrients that can assist with that from bone broth to colostrum to l-glutamine and you know i, th- I think that you know, your approach of starting with the gut seems like a very very sound place to begin Exactly, and all those, and and thanks for you know talking about you know colostrum and and bone broths. The bone broths are so important and so nutritive. I found in my own healing process, you know, having the bone broths on a on an everyday basis was something that was very very nourishing to me. Yeah, that's a that's a daily staple in my own diet now. When I'm home, is a big I, I use the uh, the kettle and fire bone broth and do a big carton of that and then i get these vegetable powders from this uh, guy dr thomas cowan his his powdered uh, heirloom vegetables and i'll put a bunch of those into the bone broth and that's just like my tonic at lunch every day and you almost feel it going to going to work in your gut right after you drink it 
Yeah, and, and you know Thomas has has written some really fascinating things, you know, in terms of of health and well being and and connecting back to the earth. It's really uh, not a dissimilar view from what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, all you guys are doing doing a great job, and Tom's been on, on the show a few times before. Uh, as an Asheville uh, uh, citizen, I would be remiss uh, not to ask you about whether or not you've actually been to this this place that blew my mind the last time I was there it's a it's a massive food city with wonderful restaurants but uh, before I mm-hmm. headed to the airport I think it was on a Saturday morning I went and stood in line at this place called Biscuit Head for what people <laughs> told me were you need to do this before you die and I was prepared for heart attack on a plate right I uh, kind of prepared mentally and then I got there and they have like you know gluten free vegan biscuits and sweet potato yep. coconut milk gravy and actually a, pr- a pretty decent menu if you wanted to go go at your biscuits and gravy from a health standpoint but I, it was probably one of the better breakfasts I've had in the past three years or so I, it was last year I visited this place Biscuit Head have you been? Oh yeah, many times and uh, biscuits, you know, with the pictures of cats all over, and then the saying that says Bic- "biscuits as big as a cat's head." Um, yeah, I've, I've I've been there many times, and they've got uh, lots of different kinds of bacon. They've got the bacon of the day. Um, that's a, a great add-on with that. Yeah, I love oh, to yeah. go there. Oh yeah, grits and fried catfish and fried green tomatoes that work. So uh, if yeah, any of you listen to me, and you a couple, <laughs> couple times a year, <laughs> if you happen to be swinging through Asheville, uh, swing by that biscuit head place. Well, uh, I've been taking some notes as we've been chatting. And if uh, if any listeners want to go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash functional medicine, I'll link to Dr. Hanaway's practice there, family to family in Asheville. And then I will also link to everything from that recent JAMA article that came out showing the benefits of functional medicine, uh, as well as several of the studies that I mentioned about everything from pomegranate peel extract to psychobiotics. I'll link to the previous episode that I did with the two uh, scientists from longevity, Joel Dudley and Chris Mason on a little bit more detail. We geeked out for like 90 minutes on how that test works. So if you're still kind of a little bit confused about say shotgun sequencing versus 16 S that would be a, a good episode for you to listen to. And I'll also link to some of these tests that we talked about like NutraVal and, and the Dutch test and the found my fitness genetic tools. And, and of course I'll even, I'll even hunt down a link to biscuit head for you guys and put that in there as well. So you can <laughs> go download those menus and, and, uh, and sell. In the meantime, Dr. Hanaway, thanks for coming on the show and sharing all this stuff with us, man. You bet. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, folks. I'm Ben Greenfield and Dr. Patrick Hanaway signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have an amazing week. Well, thanks for listening to today's show. You can grab all the show notes, the resources, pretty much everything that I mentioned over at bengreenfieldfitness.com, along with plenty of other goodies from me, including the highly helpful Ben recommends page, which is a list of pretty much everything that I've ever recommended for hormones, sleep, digestion, fat loss, performance, and plenty more. Please also know that all the links, all the promo codes that I mentioned during this and every episode help to make this podcast happen and to generate income that enables me to keep bringing you this content every single day week. So when you listen in, be sure to use the links in the show notes, use the promo codes that I generate because that helps to float this thing and keep it coming to you each and every week.